That's a, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so I'll tell you a couple things before I get started. Uh, before we get started, I should say. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I started, I had a lot of stuff going on, so I didn't start putting the presentation together until Monday. And then what happened was we got a phone call telling us that my mom had had a stroke. Um, now, so we live in Champaign, so we came, she, she didn't have a stroke. I just want you to know that off the bat. That's why I'm, it looks like I'm kind of <laughs> smiling. But we did get a phone call telling us that that had happened, right? So we got in the car and we drove up uh, to see my mom. And she was in the hospital and she had had something that was like a stroke, but it wasn't. And she's doing really well. So we're really happy that she's okay. But, uh, we, you know, we spent three days in the hospital, so we didn't have a lot of time to, um, to uh, I didn't have time to prepare. Right, and I, this is what happens when you leave things to the last moment, right? <laughs> um, but something really good happened, and and so I'll actually talk about what happens when you find yourself. One of the things that I want to talk about today is what happens when you find yourself in very uh, tight parameters, because that's actually one of the defining aspects of the way that I work and the kind of work that I make. Um, and so it happened this week. So there's a sort of there's an example, a lively example of it. So the first thing that happened was I didn't get to, I typically like to write out my lectures for two reasons. One is so that I don't forget anything, and two is so that I don't talk more than I should talk. But you're going to end up getting, that's what you're going to get, actually. You're probably going to get me talking more than I should talk. Um, so I did give myself a tiny bit of a parameter, um, and it's this little bookmarker that I gave you all. So basically what I did was I made a, a small list of uh, words that circulate around the kinds of things that I do. And I thought that instead of me sort of outlining and filling in the blanks for each one of these and coming with something prepared because I didn't have the time but also because I thought that this might be more interesting, that I would allow you to sort of use this as a menu and then we could sort of play like lecture jukebox, right? Uh, so you could sort of say, uh, pliability, and then I would talk for a little while on pliability and how that, how that has to, what, how I use that, what it has to do with my work, and we'll sort of cross some of these off as we as we go along, right? Um, I have a pen to mark some of them off. Um, the only one, if you look almost towards the bottom of the list, there's one that says shorthand. Um, it says use for others first. That I would only, the only thing I would ask you, the only rule that I would place is that you please not ask me that one until we've already done four other ones. So that one is probably uh, something that explains the title of the show in a way, but I don't want it to come up too fast. So the only way that I could prevent that was by saying, don't ask me about it until number five, right? Or after, right? Um, so yeah, that's how we're going to play today. Um, and let's see how it goes. Uh, does anybody want to go first? You just have to call out one of these words. Okay, great. So uh, the way that I think about, one of the things that happened is that when I went to art school, and I'm sure that this has happened to you, and this is sort of the dynamic of being in art school, is that you're constantly being pressed for showing your work, right? I mean, the whole thing about being an artist and the, and the making work in the classroom and then, uh, or in the studio and then having crits is all about showing your work, right? Um, and typically, um, nothing gets poo-pooed when it comes to uh, having a crit. Almost anything goes uh, in this day and age, except for the fact that I've seen this uh, both when I was a high school teacher and now that I'm teaching at the college level, except for when um, people don't work hard enough, right? So like if somebody shows up to a crit with something that you can obviously tell they threw together that morning, um, there's sort of this like, everybody, no one says it out loud, hopefully no one says it out loud, um, but there's sort of this, you know, snickering or talking, you know, underneath the breath that says like, you know, they didn't even work on that that long. I, and usually it's comparative, right? So you're comparing yourself all of the amount of work that you've put into it. And one of the things that happened to me is that when I uh, got out of art school and I wasn't able to spend eight hours a day in the studio because the Art Institute studio classes were all um, 
nine to four, right? So like I wasn't able to spend those really long uh, studio days uh, working and processing and walking around and taking notes and looking at things in the museum. Uh, when I started working as a teacher, my best hours, the most fruitful hours that I had were spent uh, teaching, right? So I would wake up uh, at 6.30 in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning, I would get ready, make lunch, go to school. I would be at school. Those were my best hours. My best hours were spent with other people's ideas and other people's work. And then I would come home very late and, you know, I didn't have, I was very tired at that point and then I wasn't in the mood to make work. But there was this little bug in my head that kept saying, you have to work, you have to work, you have to continue to work because you're a studio practitioner. Um, and then when you know my wife and I started having children, and that for me became much more important. Um, you know the whole thing about making work went almost completely out the window. Uh, so it was like a crisis moment, and that crisis moment was um, for me. Uh, it was a, it was an instance where I had to ask myself, how can I continue to work? How can I continue? to exercise everything that I've learned as, as a, a young artist while um, you know, going through the, the, the labor of the everyday. Um, I started looking at artists who were making work that was much more integrated with their daily practices, things where the artworks were becoming hard to decipher from just the things that artists were doing um, on, I mean, that people do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, that became an inspiration for me. Um, I, would I actually would like to think that more than anything, it became a, like a permission. It sort of opened up this little gate that allowed me to think about other ways of working. And the main thing that came up was labor. Like, I had to figure out a way to ratchet down my, the, the preciousness that I had over labor, over how much something was worked on. And that was tough, you know, because uh, I, that's not how I was taught, right? I was taught work, 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 work. And so uh, uh, what started happening is I started making uh, small things, uh, things that were made very fast. And I think maybe the quintessential example of, the, of that is the, the folded collages that are in the exhibit which is, you know, we would, we'll get a, ca a clothing catalog um, in the mail and I'll sit, you know, either at the, at the dining room table or, I, or I'll take it into the bedroom or I'll take it to the office and I'll just, you know, fold the, the pages until something appears and I spend literally maybe 10 minutes doing it and I come out with, you know, 30 collages or something like that, right? And then I, and then I just scan them all and some of them look great and some of them don't look that great, but the point is that they don't take a lot of time. And it's just this very quick um, work ethic that allows me to do all of the other things that I have to do in my life. And it's actually, they've informed each other. So this, the ratcheting down of the labor, the turning down, the insistence on labor has allowed me to think of other ways, um, other things in more efficient ways. Uh, teaching, uh, interpersonal relationships, um, you know, your, your spiritual journey, um, all of those things have, I think, they've become much more streamlined for me. And, uh, and it's actually allowed me to continue to work, even in the midst of uh, when I was at Penn State University writing a heavily or a super intense uh, dissertation. Good, so that, that's about as short as they'll be, I think. Uh, and is there another one? Okay. Um, so in this, the same thing, uh, one of the things that happened was that I felt very frustrated as a teacher. Like I would be in the classroom and I would, and I would be thinking, I have to be like, I'm losing time here. I'm losing studio time. And sometimes, you know, when I had, uh, I, you know, I, I happened to teach, uh, at a place where a lot of the parents of the children that I was teaching were ar artists also, or had some type of creative practice. And so we would have these conversations sometimes during parent nights and stuff. And I would just insist to them, and this is, I mean, I was, I, I would say I was pretty naive at the time, but I just was determined and I would tell them, you know, I, I, this is, I'm only doing this temporarily. Like I'm only doing this teaching thing temporarily. It's just too time consuming. Um, and so 
you know, when I when we started having kids, it was like, well, like I can't, you can't just quit your job, right? You have to uh, figure out a way to have a sustainable existence. And uh, I started trying to think about, or I should say, I just I started thinking about how the things that I was doing at school uh, could also be turned into material, right? And here I'm actually touching on one of the other ones. Um, so I started thinking about, you know, what does it mean to uh, play with the materiality of a bureaucracy, right? Uh, I'm in an institution, they have all of these demands that they're putting on me, they're asking me to do all of these things. You know, sometimes I have to do things I don't want, like, you know, uh, accompany kids to uh, school um, pep rallies or, or you know, monitor the halls or fill out, you know, attendance reports or, you know, grading sheets or whatever. Like, there were all of these things that felt counterintuitive to the way that I worked as an artist. And instead of uh, resisting them completely and just saying, oh, I'm just gonna, that's just the grunt work, I'm gonna do it so that I can go back and work in the studio, I decided that I was gonna try to figure out how those things were material. Like how all of those things could be made pliable, could be sort of turned around and you know, bent and played with in order to make them something uh, that was in line with my creative practice, right? So I have a lot of different stories of how I started to do that. And, and to be quite honest, the, be the best thing that could have happened to me was that I had a really great support network so I had um, I mean I had a great family who was helping me but also I had a really amazing principal who allowed me to do a lot of um, unorthodox things right even when he would ask me like one time he asked me to turn in my lesson plans because the district had asked everybody and he wasn't really into wasting our, the teachers times so he really wanted the teachers to be left alone so that they could teach. He was an amazing principal, actually. Um, but so, you know, there was a demand from the district where we had to turn in lesson plans. And so he sent out this email to everybody. And I, you know, I had, since I left my undergraduate program, I hadn't written a lesson plan. Uh, so I wrote back to him and I was like, what does this mean? You know, and he's like, you know, he's like, see what you could do with it or something like that. And so I actually, my students and I had been making all of these zines. And so I just took all of the zines and I, I made a little box set for them. And, you know, it, it ended up taking, like had I just written the lesson plans, I think it would have taken me a couple hours. But the little zine box took forever to make. I mean, I ended up making this entire, it had pull out parts and compartments and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I printed out all the design, I designed the things on, in Illustrator and put everything together. And then I turned that in and just sort of like crossed my fingers, right? I was like, okay, there's my lesson plan binder. Uh, and he was super excited about it. At the time, actually, Arnie Duncan was still the, the, he's now the Secretary of Education, but he, at the time, he was the CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. And there, um, there's a story that my principal told me after I handed him those lesson plans uh, that he had them in his office. And for some reason, Arnie Duncan was at the school. And uh, they were talking about standardization. My, my principal was not, um, he had some very, he had some great and open opinions about standardization. And so he was talking to Arnie about uh, the unique things that they were doing at the school that I taught at. And he showed them, he showed Arnie Duncan this box, these zines that I had made. And um, Arnie Duncan was like, could we take these? You know, could we, could we borrow these and take them up to the district so that they could be shared with other teachers? And my principal said, no, you can't have them. And that's exactly what the problem is, right? That you, you wanna take these things and fit them to every single school when in fact, you know, they may only fit here, right? They're situational in a way. So, um, oh, this is actually, I'm sorry, I'm answering the question about durationality, right? So one of the main things that I learned while I was teaching is that duration, like time passing, was, is an incredible material. And I actually learned that from my students. I learned it from having to spend 40 weeks with my students, day in and day out, right? You know, so a public school calendar is 40 weeks. And you know you see them at the beginning, and you know sometimes they're not uh, they're not your friends, right? I mean they're not supposed to be your friends, but they're 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 not friendly to you. They don't want to be there or whatever, right? And you just sort of stay. You know you stick around. You 
you allow time to be the material, right? You, you play with time even, right? You insist for more time with the students or you, you open your doors so that the students could come in, right? And I started really thinking about what does duration mean, especially because I was a high school teacher, so it was 40 weeks times four. And some of these students, uh, as a matter of fact, right before I came in, one of my former high school students called, and he's like in his 30s now, right? So he called and he just, he thought the lecture was tomorrow, right? And so he wanted to know <laughs> about the lecture. And, you know, it's just, it's wonderful to have developed those long-term relationships. And I know that this is not unfamiliar to you all, but I started seeing it in relationship to performance art and particularly durational art. So artists who were doing things that took, you know, either years to make or that took, you know, one entire year or weeks to make or months, right? Um, probably some of the most famous stuff that you might be familiar with is the Marina Abramovic stuff, right? Um, but but Der Shay uh, uh, is a, is another one that you should look at, right? And he's he he actually did one piece where for 13 years he decided that he wasn't going to make any art in public, that he was going to continue to make art, but none of it was going to be in public. And if you if you order the or if you take a look at the his retrospective catalog, it's those are like it's these 13 blank pages in the middle of the book, right? Which is like, well, they have dates on them, right? So it's, it signifies all this work that he made that was never actually seen. Uh, so I, you know, my, my understanding of what I was doing in the classroom was sort of um, overlapped with some of the things that I saw artists doing. And that was empowering in a way. So I'm telling you all of this to say that when I was in the classroom, I wasn't thinking so much like this is dreadful and I don't want to be here, I just want to be in the studio. I started thinking uh, I'm working all the time as an artist. I work 24 hours, seven days a week, right? When I'm in the classroom, when I'm in the car, when I'm at home with the family, right? When I'm anywhere else other than the studio. And actually, eventually, the studio left my practice. Like I don't I tell this funny story that when my wife and I first got married, we had this apartment building that only had one bedroom. We didn't have any kids. And so, you know, I said, can I have this other room? It was like a dining room. I said, can I have this room as a studio? And she was like, yeah, sure. Okay, so then I had that as a studio. And then when our first son was born, we were like, we got to put him somewhere. So let's put the crib in this corner of the studio. And then you could have the other three-fourths of the studio. And we were like, okay. So then when the second son was born, she was like, okay, so you should probably just take half of this room and then, because the kids need this space. And then when they started getting older, there was a little closet. She's like, why don't you move all your stuff into that closet? <laughs> so I, you know, eventually, like, the studio just sort of left my life in a way, right? I was forced into these tight parameters, and those tight parameters actually dictated so much of what I started to make after that. Okay, that's the second one. Okay. This, it's like you're picking them in the order that I wanted you to pick them. So because I started having to make little things or things that um, accumulated, I started to think about how they work in aggregate, right? And if you're familiar with that word, you know, a constellation is, is, a, is a perfect example of an aggregate, right? It's something that is composed of a bunch of tiny little parts. And what I started to realize was that sometimes you can collect things. You can make things and put them away. Make things and put them away. You can like make a little one and put it in a folder. Make another one and put it in a folder. And you can just work. You can work constantly, right? And I actually put this fourth one down here where I put work. It used to say, you know, this really famous Andy Warhol quote where he says work. Now, what does it say? Don't cry, work. You guys know this uh, phrase? Uh, Thomas Hirshhorn. Uh, this Swiss artist, he, he says it a lot, right? The, the idea of working, right? Of picking up some kind of, you know, uh, uh, energy through inertia, right? You work a little bit, you work a little bit, you work a little bit. And before you know it, you have a pile of stuff, right? You have a folder full of things. Um, all of the work that's in the show here traveled here in a, in a space about this big in the car, right? Just in the in the back of the van. Like it didn't, I, at first I thought, oh, I'm, I'm gonna have to come by myself because that's all, it's, it's a lot of work. 
then I put it all in the car. And I even took out some of the seats from the car, and I put it all in the car, and it took up this much space. So I put all the seats back in, and we all came together, right? Um, it's just like you work and you sort of collect. And then at a moment, you have an opportunity maybe to make an aggregate, to make a constellation. And then um, it has another kind of force to it. It has another type of energy to it. Um, what ends up happening is, um, I, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I would imagine that it has something to do with physics, right? It's sort of like it gathers momentum, right? At some point, like the mass of it or the amounts of it ter like, like um, turn up the energy on it and it becomes much more forceful. And I feel that way, you know, when I walk into the room because the room uh, is, you know, it has a lot of little pieces, but it functions as one really big thing. Okay, was that the third one? Yeah, okay, one more before, we, before you can ask about the shorthands. Undocumented. Undocumented? Okay, that's good. See, that, that one, it used to say undocumentable, but I, then I thought it would be funner to, funnier to put it as undocumented. I thought it would be more uncomfortable if I, if I wrote it as undocumented. It actually has to do with, with uh, duration in a way. Right? Um, teachers tend to be evaluated um, through little slivers. Right? They get asked to turn in a portfolio, for example, or they get the, the test scores of their students get looked at or something. Right? Or maybe in the most you know, sophisticated ways of doing documentation, you know, there's entire portfolios with teacher writings and images and even audio or video recordings. Right? But they're just slivers. Right? Even, even the most robust forms of documentation are just slivers. And that's great. I mean, they, that's a way of telling the story of what's happening in the classroom. But at the same time, there's a lot of what's happening in a space, in a, a, particularly in a pedagogical space, a learning space, that is undocumentable. Right? It's undocumented. It's, it's what you all have here with your professors. Right? It's this sort of like back and forth, them helping you through some of your problems or them helping you to think through some of your work. Um, it's them helping you to see the world in a different way. It's all of those things that are sort of, um, they're not placed anywhere other than that they're carried in your body in some way or another. Like your body carries them, right? Uh, when I started seeing those things in the work, I start, when I started seeing those things in my teaching work, I started trying to bring those things into my art practices too. I started trying to think about how could I do things in my art practice that were undocumentable, right? So I've done some performances um, where I've set up the situation in a way that they're very difficult to see, right? Uh, this thing that I did um, for my friend Alberto at the MCA was just uh, me laying in a bed for 14 hours reading to people, right? I mean, it's just insufferable, like intolerable performance. Like nobody, I, I was there the whole time, but nobody else was there the whole time. But yet at the same time, people were, were showing up and they would sit down and I would read to them and I would talk to them and we would have conversations about the work that I was doing and what they were doing in their lives, what they were reading. And what, be, what, came, what happened very curiously was that that little bed that I was laying on became a classroom in a way. It reflected the same activities that, I had part, that I've been participating ever since I, in that I, ever since I've become a teacher. The conversations, taking care of each other, listening to each other, thinking about each, everybody's interests, being provoked by other people's words, right? Um, and I, so I've become very interested. If you go on my website, you can see some of the, again, slivers, little documentation of things that are way bigger, that are impossible to document, right? That bed piece, or uh, I gave a, um, a talk at the, at the International Zizek Conference in Cincinnati last year, and I, when I sent in my proposals for the conference, I asked if I could do the presentations um, at five o'clock in the morning in a van. Uh, <laughs> they said, they, surprisingly, they said yes, right? Uh, so, I, so I souped up this van that I had rented from the university 
And I sat out there, I gave three presentations, all at five o'clock in the morning every day of the conference. And the first two days, no one showed up. But I still gave the presentations, like I just gave them, right? Um, uh, and then the last day, four people showed up, right? Uh, but what was really interesting was that those people had to work so hard to get to that presentation. Because, I mean, if you've ever had the experience of going to a conference, you know, the day before, they were out really late, you know, so they, I don't even know if they slept, but they got up at five o'clock to go to the conference. I gave them some free art at the end, so just to compensate for their trouble. Uh, so, so that's undocumented. Okay, that was the fourth one. We'll do a few more, and then we'll just do a, a quick Q&A, and then we'll be done. Perfect. Um, so we, my wife and I were both born in Chicago, and we were born and raised here, and then uh, eight years ago, seven years ago, eight or seven years ago, I don't remember now, I think it was 80 years ago, 2006, um, I met a man, his name was Charles Garoyan, uh, who started talking to me about grad school, and he was like, hey, you know, do you want to go to grad school? And I was like, well, at first he was asking me what I was doing in, as a classroom teacher, so I started telling him. And then he was like, how about grad school? And I was like, well, I'm not going to quit my job to go to grad school, for one. Um, and I don't want to like work all day and then go to grad school in the evening. I just felt that it was too much of a commitment. So he was like, uh, do you, why don't you go to, why don't you come to my school? He taught at Penn State. And he's like, why don't you come to my school and we'll give you a fellowship and that will give you a tuition waiver and you can teach for us a little bit and so you'll get a stipend. And he's like, you're not going to be rich, but you know, you'll be able to do your work and be sustained. And I had never heard, like nobody in my family went to college, so I had never heard that you can get graduate degrees on stipends, right? I don't know if, you may not know this either, right? But it's possible, right? So like, here's a little plug, right? If you're interested in going to grad school at U of I, talk to me, you may be able to do it for nothing, right? I mean, there, you, do have to, you do have to pay something, but you're paying with your life, not with your money, right? Um, so if you're interested in that, that's what happened. Somebody told me about that and I was like, oh, so I could go to grad school um, and just um, not pay for it? And he was like, yes, we'll make it work. And he was very supportive the whole time I was over there and he really helped me to keep, my, keep our head above water. But we left, we left Chicago. We had never lived anywhere else. And we moved to the middle of Pennsylvania. And if you've ever been to, to Pennsylvania with James, Carville, that uh, pundit, describes Pennsylvania as Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in between, right? And it does feel like that. And so we were, you know, we had lived in Chicago our whole lives, and we, it, was, it felt like we kind of moved to Alabama. Um, and we were there for three years, and when the position at U of I opened up, we applied for it because we were desperate to get back to Illinois, and we thought, okay, that's close enough, right? Like if Chicago's the, the bullseye, U of I is close enough to that bullseye that we're just, we just want to hit that, right? And, you know, thank God we ended up there. Uh, but even while we were there, for those of you who don't know, it's about two and a half hours, three hours south of here. Um, it still felt far. It still felt very far. All of our families in the Chicagoland area, all of our friends and contacts and networks and everybody that we know is up here, right? And we just felt, in a way, exiled. Right? We felt like we couldn't get back no matter how much we tried. Right? Like positions would open up up here and we would be like, oh, does that look right for us? You know, and, and just nothing was working to get us back up. Right? And even to this day, it feels that way. So when I was thinking about that whole time, you know, I was feeling, you know, you know when you start feeling, uh, you know, I don't, maybe you don't know how this feels, but I felt like there's a point when, when you start um, praying, right? You just start saying, like, Am I, have I been abandoned, right? You start feeling that way, right? Um, I want you to know that it hasn't been torture down at UI, right? I mean, it's, been, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing university, and the resources and the, you know, it was just a matter of not being home. That's all it was. You know, it was like an anxiety about not being home, right? And, you know, we're adults and all that. It's not like we can't handle that. But, you know, what happened this week with my mom getting sick, 
um, is was a case in point. You know, as we were driving up here, we were just thinking, you know, if we lived closer, we wouldn't have to be rushing out in the middle of the night driving, you know, three hours on this godforsaken highway. Have you ever driven the 57? <laughs> it's it's pitch dark down there, right? So it's like you're driving, you don't even know what's ahead of you, right? Uh, so, you know, you, you get this, you do, we do get this feeling because it feels far away. And again, we understand, we've spoken to people and, we've, and we're like, oh, we're so far away from home. And, and they're like, how far is your family? And we're like, oh, they live in Chicago. And they're like, two and a half hours. They, they almost think like we're being babies, right? Which we probably are in a way being babies. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's all this work that I've been making in little bits. Right? And so I have sort of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into no shorthands, if that's okay. I have sort of felt that even though I, there's this sort of sense of, there's, par, there's a partial sense of feeling abandoned uh, because you can't be home, there's another part that in retrospect uh, understands that um, you're not alone, right? That it's, that it's actually, there's actually a lot of evidence, and I, this is what I, the work I feel, is the evidence of the fact that we're not alone. And actually, the title was inspired by this, by, an, I, I took the opportunity that I was having the show at Trinity Christian um, to use something from, uh, I wrote it down here, from Numbers, the book of Numbers, right? Which is this instance where, um, the, you know, after uh, Moses and the Israelites have left uh, Egypt, that the Israelites are like, they're complaining because they don't have enough food or they don't have what they want, right? And they're complaining to Moses, so Moses is talking to God about it, and God is saying, uh, my hand is not gonna be short to help you, right? So he, he makes this expression about like the length of his hand, which I, which I find to be an incredibly vis visual expression, but also kind of wonderful in terms of uh, 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 the kind of rescue that is available, right? And, and I also thought that the word shorthand is, you know, so there's a double meaning there. One is this, it comes from this visual in numbers. And the other one is this idea of shorthand, right? Like, the, like doing something in a short way or a shortcut, like having a shortcut. Um, and even when you apply a lot of shortcuts, which I have done, right, by making these very quick works, um, I'll tell you that the paintings that are in the show were all made, I made 150 paintings in three weeks. So basically what I did was I went to the store and I bought all of their pre-stretched canvases that were all the same size. And I went, I have this tiny office, at, it's not tiny, but I, went, I have this office at the University of Illinois. It's not a studio. And I, and I just put all, all of those canvases in there and I just made all 160 paintings all at the same time under this really tight time restriction and space restriction, right? Um, and I, and again, you know, I feel like that, all of that is the evidence of, you know, both of the double meanings of this shorthand title, right? Um, sometimes accumulated shortcuts turn into gargantuan manifestations or constellations. I think that's it. Thank you. So I think I can take a question, if there's a question. If not, we can also talk in the gallery. I, I, oh, oh, you're probably itching to see the show because yesterday I came in to shoot the show and I, I had asked John if he could do it for me because I didn't think I was going to be able to come up. And then when I showed up yesterday, he's like, I didn't get a chance to do it. Why don't you do it? That way you know what you want. So I was like, okay. So I started shooting the show. And, you know, I was shooting shots with everything in the, or like things together. And I had actually seen a couple days ago, I had seen this image by um, uh, Franz West of these, uh, like, these installations that he makes where he hangs up a, a bunch of paintings right next to each other. And the way that he was shooting them, he was just like focusing on one object and he was cropping all the rest of them so they were just sort of poking him from the side. 
So I thought, that's how I'll do it. I'll shoot this show that way, because everything's hung in that way. But when I started doing it, I, I think I might have accidentally shot the wall at one point, and I decided to eliminate for this presentation all of the, the focal points. And the reason that I wanted to do that was because um, in my work, in the kind of work that I make, the in-between spaces become prominent. They become the point where the, where the energy or the vibration exists. And uh, I've become very interested in that in-between space. That's why I like to put things that are not like each other next to each other. Um, and so because John didn't take the pictures, I was forced into this. And I am actually very happy with the way that um, that came out. So, that's, so I bet you want to see the show now. So we can talk in there if you'd like. Is there anything else? OK, thank you, everybody.